Hello, guys. Hi, um, good morning. So my name is Vilanov Majov. And I'm Jan Vigara. <laughs> <laughs> so um, today we'll be talking about immutable open strike infrastructure and how we approach the at Paddy Power Bet Fair. So first off, just a bit of background about us. So what makes us different? We merged, Paddy Power and Betfair merged uh, 2016 to form a FTSE 100 company. Uh, and we have offices around the globe. So we have offices in the UK, Romania, Portugal, Ireland, Malta, Gibraltar, USA, and Australia as well. Um, and if you're curious about the stuff we're doing, we also have an engineering blog, which you can have a look at betsandbiz.com. And in our company, we have over 1,000 engineers. Some of our products are, we run a betting exchange, we have a sports book, and we also offer games in retail. Uh, and just to give you some numbers of the number of transactions we do daily, we have 135 million daily transactions going through our systems, and we do 30 billion daily API calls as well. Uh, in terms, and all of this, obviously, you, as you can imagine, generates quite a lot of logs. So um, we do 2.5 terabytes of daily logs, and we have 120,000 monitoring points every second generated from all of those servers. Uh, and our transaction times are within four milliseconds. We are also building a 100,000 uh, core OpenStack cloud, and we have two, two, terab two petabytes of storage. So this is our OpenStack journey. And we had a four-week pilot back in 2015. Uh, then we had a six-month, <laughs> sorry, four-week uh, proof of concept. Um, and we had a six-month pilot building out active, active data centers uh, where we onboarded to customer-facing applications. And this also allowed us to test our self-service workflows, which we are going to see in a bit. Uh, we closed the pilot after those first two applications, and so far we've upgraded over 100 applications so far. We also upgraded to Nuage 3.2, R10, and we're, we also built our test lab. So what we're currently working on is doing our Nuage and OpenStack upgrades. All right, so how many of you have already upgraded their OpenStack infrastructure? Yeah, how easy was it? Yeah, <laughs> so we're using um, Red Hat for um, OpenStack. And if we want to upgrade from Open, uh, OSPD 7 to OSPD 10, we have a couple of steps. So we had two different solutions for that. First one is to follow the, the production. So the, the documentation. So the documentation says upgrade the director, do a YUM update, then upgrade the other cloud image, upload them to your glance, and then you can start upgrading your other clouds. But first step is you need to modify your heat templates for that. And this is where things start going wrong because we're using a spine and leaf architecture, which means we have very specific and very customized heat templates and which means that upgrading will mean uh, a lot of testing, a lot of uh, refactoring, and um, things have evolved quite a lot between the two, the two versions. And that's probably, uh, as we trying to move from OSP 7 to OSP 10, there's a huge gap between the, the two. So the other solution would be to deploy a brand new OpenStack and migrate all the VMs from the old one to the, the new one, so which is the solution we, we choose. And we're going to explain to you how we, we are going to achieve that. So first, here is the reference architecture we, we are on. So, yeah. so sitting at the top, we have a global load balancer that diverting traffic to our two data centers. After that, we have Juniper firewalls and Citrix Next scalar load balancers. Uh, and then we have the Nuage um, gateways directing traffic to our clouds, and then we have our Red Hat OpenStack implementation sitting on KVM hypervisors. And we also have Aristotle Rack switches and some plain libvirt hypervisor, uh, some plain lib hypervisors for our common infrastructure like LDAP, DNS, and NTP. And this is replicated across the two data centers. And we use NetApp and pure storage for 
storage. Um, and this is some of the tooling we're using for our continuous delivery toolchain. So we use PhotoWorks Go for scheduling and visualization of the pipelines. We use Jenkins, like most other people. We use GitLab for our, for our version control. And we use Chef and Ansible for configuration management and orchestration. We use Artifactory for our artifacts and RPMs. And we use Qualys for security scanning. OK, so if you want to do immutable infrastructure, uh, and in the case of OpenStack, you probably need to start from really at the bottom. So how you provision your infrastructure, how you do all of this. So let's start with how we decided to provision the, the network. And just as a quick review, um, presentation, how we use Spine and Leaf. So uh, is anybody familiar with the Spine and Leaf architecture? OK, a couple of you. It's perfect. I won't have to explain too much. Uh, so Basically, the idea is uh, you split um, the traffic uh, on your, uh, uh, you have the spines, and then you have the leaves connected to the spines, and each of them are in the different BGP routing, uh, which simplify and prevent uh, all the usual tra um, traffic you can have in, in between racks. So from this uh, architecture, we have this rack diagram, and um, what we have is we have two spines in each rack, one uh, management switch for where we're connecting the ILO and one management switch for the rest of the, uh, for the, the provisioning of the, the servers. So we started working on a, um, an Ansible playbook that is going to provision the switches and making the connection between all the spine and leaves and reconfigure the BGP, reconfigure everything. So we started by defining the inventory file, which represents what we have in the, in the rack, if you have a look. And based from this inventory file, we know where the switch is located. And from the switch, uh, the location of the switch, we're able to make some clever uh, connection between the, the two and able to reconfigure the whole network each time. So the process we use is pretty easy. When we provision a new rack, we spin up the, the switch. They pick CBoot, pick up the configuration through the TPS, and they are, they, we push the minimal configuration, do some firmware upgrade, and the switch is ready. And then we run an Ansible playbook that will reconfigure everything. So as an example, we have, in that case, uh, just a template that is reconfiguring the BGP between the spine and the leaves and making sure the connection is, um, is done. So um, for our SDN, we use Nuash Networks. And um, I'm going to cover how we consume Nuash for our SDN. So we wanted to make the process for the developers as easy as possible and also sell service. So we have designed a set of um, YAML config files, which they need to fill out and consume their network that way. So those files look like this. They have a subnet YAML, which specifies the domain name where the application should be deployed to. And they also specify how many, the maximum number of instances they might need for the application. Uh, because developers don't really care about subnet sizes, they care about how many VMs they want to have. And this just allows us to make it very easy for them saying, OK, I need X amount of VMs, and I just put a number, and I don't care about the rest which makes it nice and simple. And we also have another file with the security ACLs. So in this example, we can see that we have an ingress ACL. By the way, this is from the point of view of the VM, because it's very, we try to make the self-service workflow very developer focused. So we're trying to hide the network complexity from them, but just make it easy for them to reason about it. So ingress is, go, is flowing into the VM, not leaving, not into the network. So here we have a fairly simple ACL, which is incoming on port 8080. And next to it, we have an egress ACL, which is to connect to external databases, such as MySQL. So how this maps into, Nuash, into the Nuash object model? So using the same configuration we saw before, we see that we've ended up with a zone for every application. And under the zone is, in, is the red one. Um, and under each zone, we have the subnet, which, which we've allocated for this application. In this case, it's a slash 26. And 
But on the right side of that, we can see the virtual machine instances. Some have one, some have two. This is a queue environment, so the scale is fairly small. And the way we do our ACLs is um, we have the security policies attached to at the zone level. So all the VMs on the rest on the zone share the ACLs. And you can see how they look like in NUASH. Okay, so now we have the network set up. Uh, next step will be to provision the physical infrastructure. So how we do this, um, again, if you have a look at our rack design, so as I was mentioning, um, each rack has its own set of network and IP addresses. So in our case, we are just going to provision the servers and you have at the top the IP addresses we're using for uh, the ILO um, of the server. So we translate this still in the same inventory file. Uh, we are adding the servers we want to provision. And we start adding a couple of informations like uh, the ILO address we're going to use, the unit number where the server is located. And based from that, uh, the process we are going through is we try to reconfigure, we reconfigure the network. So again, based on some convention and some uh, templates, we're able to create the configuration, push the configuration to the switch to reconfigure the port channel, reconfigure um, the network provisioning, the, all the information we need. Then the next step is to create the DNS entry, change some ILO parameters, power off the server, add the server to the HP One View to manage it and to apply the configuration we want to apply on the server. And then the server is ready. So here is some example of uh, how we configure the port channel. So based on some information, so the inventory file I show is really simplified, there's more data than that. But based on that, we are uh, extracting some information and from this inventory file and the rack where the server is located and the um, switch is connected, we are able to push the configuration to the correct switches and we're able to create the port channel, push the VLANs we want to use and uh, things like this. So then here is some of the sample of our playbook uh, that is um, provisioning the server. So on the left side, you have some of the things we wrote specifically for ILO and for changing the ILO uh, parameters, waiting, resetting the, the host, and then uh, creating the record in InfoBlox. And then after that, it's powering off the server and adding it to um, HP OneView. So after a couple of uh, minutes when the playbook is running, or after a couple of hours when the firmware has been updated on the servers, we can see that it's um, finally in HP One View. And now that we have the hypervisors, let's see how we actually use them. So we have created a self-service workflow for VM creation. And the way the developers consume this is by filling out a fairly simple Ansible inventory file. So how many of you are familiar with Ansible? Okay, quite a few, good. So you should be fairly familiar with this. So um, we, first of all, we have a naming standard for our instances, which is data center replication, the host number, and then the environment it is in. We also define the number of vCPUs, RAM, disk, and image we wanna use for each instance. We also, and in the placement prefix and the host, we define what hypervisors we want those instances to land on. The reason we allocate hypervisors rather than have a shared pool is because we wanted to avoid the noisy neighbor problem. Um, and, we are, and we also specify what application we want to deploy on each instance. In this case, it's our app. So how, how do we actually deploy all of this? So we have a Go, ThoughtWorks Go pipeline, and the first stage of it is just to pull down all of those config files and Ansible playbooks onto the Go agent. We then set up the prerequisites in OpenStack. This includes creating the flavor and the host aggregates. We then check the capacity on the hypervisor, just to make sure we have enough capacity on the hypervisor for the deployment we're about to do. And if we don't have enough, we obviously break the pipeline. We then create the layer three network. So this will create the NUASH subnet and also the corresponding entity in OpenStack and create the ACLs. So we do AB subnets. So this will be the A subnet in this case because we have nothing in our cloud in this instance. 
The next step would be launching the VMs. This is consuming the static inventory file we saw earlier. Our next step in the pipeline is run Ansible. So this will apply our Ansible role on top of those VMs and get the application ready to be put in production. The next step is create VIP. So this will configure our net scalers and the services on them. Rolling update is where it gets interesting. So this will prepare the application and migrate any state you've needed. And then it will put it in service. At which point we also test the application just to make sure it's all good and we promote it in Jenkins, ready to be pushed onto the next environment. And then we obviously clean up the previous version, which we don't have one because it's a fresh deployment. So we use the same process from QA to integration to perf and then to production. We use exactly the same process, just on a different scale with each environment. OK, so we thought that could be a good idea to use the same pipeline and to find a way to deploy the OpenStack director. Um, and so that's what we started doing. So um, instead of using uh, OpenStack to deploy the application, we deploy uh, WestPD directly on a Libvirt server, but it's going through exactly the same, the same process. Um, so a couple of things for the uh, one you want to provision um, an OpenStack infrastructure. So you need a couple of LAN and VLAN uh, to be created. So the first one is the, um, the one at the top, which is the VLAN for the provisioning. Um, where this is where the server is going to pixie boot and then connect to the ironic sitting on top of uh, on in OSPD will pixie boot get the configuration and be deployed and then you have the two other um, network one for the internal API and one for the external API where we can query uh, everything so uh, and we have then two different networks for each hypervisor one which is connected to the data network and the other one which is connected to the Nuage network where we will provision the, um, the, uh, the, the network, the subnet. Uh, at the top, we have also the VLANs for the, um, uh, the ILO. And if you have a look, each rack again has its own sets of um, IP addresses for the ILO. So all those IP address, uh, all this network, um, we try to convert them. So we wrote a playbook that deployed the OSPD and we just converted all the information you could find on the previous slide into um, actual data. So here is the YAML file we're using, and we're feeding it to our Ansible playbook. And from this data, so where we have the VLANs we want to provision for the uh, data storage, uh, all the internal APIs um, with the VLANs, where it sits on the interface, and all those, those information, plus for each rack what is the network we are going to use. So each rack, again, uh, in the spine and leaf architecture has its own set of IPs um, to prevent um, problems. <laughs> uh, so from those information, we create uh, some templates which are going to provision first the, um, the overcloud configuration. So this is the configuration that is used by uh, RDO that will create uh, all the, the other, other things. So, we try to use convention as much as possible. And as part of the convention, if you have a look, we use the CIDR um, uh, IP range. And from that, we just extrapolate and extract some information. So we get the first IP address available. We get uh, ranges based from the, those information. So that's the first step that is creating and provisioning the, the director. Then we have our very specific custom uh, OOO templates. So this is the one that generates from the rack. Uh, we go back from the rack we define here. So we can specify how many racks we want to deploy OpenStack on top. And from this, we extrapolate and we generate the number. So if you have a look at the uh, thing at the top and at the bottom, we, have, um, we generate each rack and each configuration for each rack. So that's how we do this. And then we have uh, the last step, which is uh, creating the custom file where we have all the, um, the custom racks uh, and how many uh, server we put in each rack. Once we have everything, we put this through the pipeline and uh, everything is green, go through exactly the same pipeline. And we have 
Same thing through different environments. We are able to test and make sure that before reaching the prod environment, we tested everything. OK, so at the end of this process, we should have an OpenStack director ready. And we are able to start scaling out. So for us, scaling out will mean adding new servers. So again, we have automated the process using Ansible. And we are still using the same uh, inventory files, so where we describe the entire infrastructure. And this is where we start adding a bit more intelligence into the, the inventory file. So if you have a look on the left of an, our, our inventory file, we have the cloud we are going to use. And we use that inside our Ansible playbook to match what you have on the right-hand side, which is the um, cloud configuration. So this is the OS client config, which is then used by uh, Shade and by Ansible to target which cloud we are going to, to put things. So then the process is pretty simple, uh, pretty simple. We reconfigure the switches to push the VLAN. So that's exactly the same step we went through at the beginning. Um, we get the node from Ironic to make sure that the node is not already there. And then gather some ILO facts for memory, CPUs, this kind of information. Then we add the node to Ironic, so the OSPD of um, Ironic. Set the node in maintenance mode, uh, introspect the node to get some information from the, the node itself, and then exit the maintenance. And we update the template to say we have X amount of um, servers. So the, this is the playbook we were using. So again, we gather facts from the ILO. Um, and we, know, we try to figure out if the server is a new one or an existing one. Um, and then Based on that, we add the node to Ironic. So we modified a tiny bit the OS Ironic module to add a couple more informations, like we are pushing the rack and the unit and some other um, informations, like the profile, uh, this type of things. Because later on, we're going to use this, and I will explain how. And in the result, you have um, inside the OSPD, you have, uh, if you do a node, uh, Ironic node list, this is the result from Ironic. And you can see that some of the information we pass uh, at the big in the inventory file are pushed directly to the Ironic node. OK, so we have the first one. We know how to enroll servers. Uh, we know how to do a scale out. So doing scale out is pretty easy using hit and scaling out the, the infrastructure. Next step is how do we create a second instance? So that's pretty easy. We, if you remember our network, we just duplicate it, so copy and paste. We change a couple of IP addresses, a couple of VLANs. So instead of using, as we had previously, VLAN, which were 100, 200, 400, we change that to use 101, 102, 401. And we change also a couple of IP addresses to completely isolate everything. Same thing for the racks. We want to isolate the racks and make sure they are not on the same, uh, same one, and then we reprovision the new OSPD. So at the same time, we will have two OS OpenStack directors running, one for the OSP10, seven, and the other one for the OSP10. Then, how do we move servers from one OpenStack director to the other one? So from one instance to the other one. Um, if you have a look at the diagram, so we've, we have decided to go down the path of one rack is dedicated for one cloud. Oh, at the beginning, we have all the racks in the same cloud. And over the time, we're going to provision new racks and migrate the VMs to the new racks. And we'll explain how we do, do this. So in our example, um, this is, if you remember the inventory file, we have all the, the cloud on the left, which is uh, i2lab OSP7. And if we want to create more um, entries or specify which node or which rack is going to be in which cloud. This is how we do this. So we specify the cloud we are going to use. And this is going to match, again, the cloud configuration. And we target the two different OSP directors. So the process is exactly the same. We enroll the server in the new cloud. And then how do we migrate oh, before enrolling? We need to delete them from the old cloud. So we it's still a work in progress. Uh, we're still working on that. But the idea is to, as you remember in the 
ironic node, we know which rack is there. So we are able to do some dynamic query or dynamic inventory to gather all the information, filter that by rack, and then destroy all the machines inside this rack, add them to the new one, and then scale out the, the, exit, the new run. So this is how we, um, this is the reference architecture we have at the end. So we have at the same time two different OpenStack running. And now this is the trick. And so now that we have our new cloud, radiant waiting but somewhat empty, how do we actually consume it? So um, to do that, we wrote a custom Ansible dynamic inventory for OpenStack, which allows us to query multiple clouds. Um, so, again, using OS Client Config, we have our clouds in a, in a fairly simple YAML file. So, in this case, we have our OSP7 and OSP10 named clouds. And this, the same config also allows us to have many other clouds, for example, if we want to do the other data center. So, they can all be within the same config file. So, we, to, I, how do we actually specify which one is the old cloud and which one is the new cloud? So, it's fairly simple. We just pass OS Cloud inventory, um, sorry, environment variables to specify that the old cloud is OS P7 and then the new cloud is OS P10. So, we run the normal dynamic inventory to, get, to gather a list of hosts and then we combine them into a single unified inventory list, but each instance is also tagged with the cloud it lives in, if we need to, do, to use that later. And this is the playbook to actually allow us to reason over the clouds we have. Because we can name the clouds whatever we want, but we wanted to use the same playbooks for all the clouds we have going forward. We didn't want to hard code the values of those clouds, so we format, we rewrite the name of the cloud dynamically to old cloud and new cloud, allowing us to easily reason over them. So this is an example of how we would create an instance into our new cloud. Uh, I won't go over the Ansible, but it's fairly simple. Um, and again, to delete from the old cloud, which we no longer need, we would do pretty much the same process, but with state absent targeting the old cloud and the old parameter for our server. So, and this is the theory so far. So how do we actually do it? So if we go back to this, now that we have our OSP 10 cloud adjacent to our OSP 7, again, we go through set of prerequisites, this pulls down the config, and we create our flavors and host aggregates into the new cloud. We check capacity, should be empty, so it should be fine, right? Uh, we create our B network as an entity under the new cloud, but also linked into Nuash, which is a shared resource for both of them. We launch our VMs into the new cloud. Again, we apply our Ansible role on top. We create the VIP. Well, the VIP already exists, so Ansible will say, okay, moving on. Uh, and rolling update. So we put our new application in service and take the old ones off the load balancer. And then we make sure everything is okay. And then we clean down the old instances from the old cloud. So when we do this for all of our applications, we know that this hypervisor is ready to be recycled and put into the new cloud. And yeah, we reclaim the hypervisor. Okay, so we've done our upgrades and we can go grab a coffee. Uh, but the trick is we, <laughs> as everything is automated, that's pretty easy to do. But um, how we make sure that VMs are going to be migrated from one cloud to another. Uh, we have a strict policy, uh, Paddy Power Betfair, where we say a VM cannot last longer than 30 days for security reason. Uh, so the idea is developer will, be, will have to redeploy their application in the, new, uh, in the new environment. But they don't know that that's the new or the old one. They don't see that. We just allocate them a new hypervisor, run the pipeline, and it's deployed on the new, on the new environment. So theoretically, within the next 30, 60 days, we should be able to migrate the thing seamlessly without any downtime, and we have uh, fixed our problem. Do you have any 
questions for us? We have a bit of time. Uh, yeah, yep, yeah, I think so. Can There's you a mic, you, please. Uh, what size is your cloud? I mean, how many nodes uh, is director able to handle? Um, the moment, uh, do you know how? Yeah, we have around 650 nodes in two data centers, so 650 hypervisors, and we are on a regular basis provisioning new, new nodes. Um, yeah. So it's six. 50 divided by two? Yeah, per, so it's three, 325 per data center okay. at the moment, but. Sorry? So our end state is 1,300, so we're gonna have 650 for each data center. Uh, you, you didn't tell anything about storage uh, propagation. Could you, could you tell us what kind of storage you use and how do you automate it? Yeah, so we, we're using uh, pure storage and NetApp. And we're using so, um, Cinder for the, that. And we have a presentation later today uh, on how we do this exactly. Uh, but the process is exactly the same. We create uh, the Cinder volume, attach it to the VM. Um, and once we provision the new one, we re-import the volume into the new cloud and reattach the volume to the new, to the new VM. That's really a short explanation. Because there are a shared resource within the cloud, it allows us to do that. The same with load balancers, storage, and SDN. Sorry, I missed the first 10 minutes if you are discussed this. Organizationally, what was your approach, top down or bottom up, in application to infrastructure and infra infrastructure to application to encourage this uh, CI CD mentality to, to start with from an application perspective? Uh, it was top down. Top down. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. <laughs>